how do lobsters grow? You have a hard, fixed shell, a soft, growing lobster. I'm going to have to think about that. I'll come back to it later. Now, I need your help. About 10 days ago, my heart was racing. My stomach was churning. My mouth was dry. My skin was sweaty. What emotion was I experiencing? What emotion? No. No. Ireland had just beat England at rugby. <laughs> so how is it that two such different emotions, anxiety and stress and excitement, can have the same bodily symptoms? Well, these symptoms are the sympathetic autonomic nervous system in fight or flight mode. These are symptoms of arousal. And that arousal is general and is common to many different emotions. Anxiety, excitement, anger, indeed sexual attraction as well. So how do I know what emotion I'm experiencing? Well, I knew I was excited in that pub in Sligo with people shouting about me. I knew I was excited because of the context. Had I been down a dark lane with someone coming at me with a knife, I would have known that I was frightened, that I was anxious. But arousal, which is the common energy of emotions, is like all energy, something that can be harnessed in a number of different ways. There was a very clever psychologist called Alison Brooks in Pittsburgh who, who used this principle for practical effect. She took a group of people like you and she took them one by one to come down here like me and do mental arithmetic and sing karaoke in front of a critical audience like you. And their actual objective performance was measured. They were also wired up to a heart monitor and they could see on a screen the pounding of their heart represented there. But she made one other small adjustment. One group of people had to say three words before they performed. Three words out loud. They had to say, I feel anxious. A fairly accurate representation of a state of affairs. The other group had to say three different words. They had to say, I feel excited. And remarkably, that group performed significantly better at the karaoke and at the mental arithmetic in objective terms. They performed better. Why was that? Well, the human brain is the most complex entity in the known universe. And it has the capacity to create its own context. In this case, by language, by saying three words, I feel excited, it was like an alchemy transforming one emotion, anxiety and a sense of threat, into another one, excitement and a sense of challenge and possibility. But how did that work scientifically? Well, to explain that, I have to show you one of the most famous curves in all of psychology. It's called the Yerkes-Dodson curve from 1908. 
which showed that for any performance, exam, speech, musical performance, there's an optimal level of arousal. Below that optimal level, the performance is poor. And above that optimal level, performance is poor. And in order to get yourself to that optimal level, that sweet spot, you need to be able to engineer your own arousal. And stress, the stress of performance, can actually push you up to that peak. But it can also push you over the other side, such that you have too much arousal, which actually interferes with how your brain is functioning. And so what Alison Brooks did was by changing the context with these three words, she pulled the people back from the left side of that curve up to the top, up to their sweet spot, so that actually they could perform significantly better. And they performed significantly better because of a natural chemical in the brain called norepinephrine, or as it's called in Europe, not adrenaline, which any time we experience this arousal of the fight or flight system, our brain generates increasing levels of norepinephrine. And that's generated in a part of the brain, a tiny sliver of tissue called the locus ceruleus, deep in the middle of your brain. And when the norepinephrine is at this optimal level, your brain performs like an orchestra. The different parts of your brain are sweetly synchronized. Too little, and it doesn't work so well. Too much, and it doesn't work so well. So I'm going to give you a little tip now. I'd like you to close your eyes for a moment. I'll do this too. And we're going to, to your own count of five. Come, breathe in slowly to the count of five and then out to the count of five. So let's do that now. How many of you felt a tiny bit different after doing that compared to before? Put up your hand if you did. That's because you changed your brain chemistry. Because the remarkable thing about the locus ceruleus, the brain's only source of norepinephrine, noradrenaline, is chemosensitive. It responds to how much carbon dioxide is in your blood. And you control moment to moment how much carbon dioxide is in your blood by the way you breathe. And so you have a second method to bring yourself to the sweet spot of performance. You have a second method by using your breath to either pull you back from the over-stimulated overdose of norepinephrine, right-hand side of this curve. But you can also sometimes, if you're in the left side of the curve, you can use your breathing by breathing in a different way to bring yourself up to that sweet spot. There's another sweet spot I want to tell you about. It's even more important. And that's called the adversity sweet spot. And a sportsman like Tiger Woods, he knows all about this. For him, the day he is not nervous is the day he quits. He feels the rush of that anxiety. He uses that arousal of performance to get himself to the sweet spot. And all the great sportsmen and women of the world implicitly or explicitly know that to perform at their best, they have to manage the energy, this non-specific arousal that's common to all emotions and use it to get their brain to that orchestrated symphonic performance of coordinated firing of the different parts of the brain by using the arousal 
and by titrating and modifying how much norepinephrine, noradrenaline, is in their brain. And if you can do that, then you can also manage the second sweet spot that I'm going to talk about, which is the adversity sweet spot. It turns out that people who in their youth or childhood and childhood had very little adversity or very little stress end up being more emotionally vulnerable as young adults. They're more likely to be depressed and anxious, be having difficulties in life. Experience of moderate stressors inoculates you to some extent, vaccinates you against subsequent greater stresses. Severe stress is another matter because what we have here is another sweet spot, another inverted U-shaped curve, where too little adversity in life leaves you exposed and vulnerable in the similar way to too much adversity. But there's a sweet spot in the middle that leaves you more emotionally tough. But it's not just emotions. If you, in middle age, experience low back pain, and you've had no or little adversity in your previous life, you're significantly more likely to be taking severe painkilling medications, to be disabled, and to be chronically off work. So it affects your pain tolerance, your physical pain tolerance as well. Again, this sweet spot of moderate adversity. But even more remarkably, some people in their 70s and 80s show memory decline, a minority. But once you have fragile memory at that age, your likelihood of that progressing is greatly increased. So in one study in Holland, sure enough, they measured people's cognitive function over a two-year period and found indeed there was a decline in cognitive function among these people who had fragile memory. Except, except for people who had moderate levels of stress during that two-year period. What do I mean by moderate levels of stress? I mean not death of a spouse, that's too stressful, but serious illness of a spouse, stroke or cancer, conflict with family or neighbours, these kind of moderate stressors, not nice stressors by any means, bizarrely seem to man help maintain cognitive function in older people who otherwise were going to decline. In fact, if they had three such stressors in the two-year period, they showed no cognitive decline whatsoever. Why is that? Well, if you are 70 or 80 and not working perhaps, you're maybe living a very pleasant life, maybe very predictable, your brain is probably not going to be being challenged. When our brain is challenged, it generates norepinephrine, noradrenaline, by switching on the locus ceruleus. And norepinephrine is a remarkable drug because what it does is it helps grow new brain cells and new brain connections and it may even reduce the toxicity of the amyloid plaques that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. And so if you're a person who suddenly is faced with having to cope with a seriously ill spouse or cope with family conflict, it may not be nice, but it actually forces your brain to produce a natural and incredibly positive drug, norepinephrine, noradrenaline as long as it doesn't push you over on the other side of the curve, which is why severe adversity can be as bad as no adversity. So, I'd like to go back to Mr. Lobster. How does he grow? An ambitious, hungry, growing, soft lobster in a hard, unyielding shell. What happens? What happens is it starts to hurt the sharp interior of the shell. He's rubbing against it. There's pain, there's stress, there's adversity. What does he do? 
he looks around and finds a big rock. He crawls under the rock and he painfully squeezes out of the old shell. And he lies there vulnerable until a new bigger shell grows. He does that several times in a lobster life. I think that's not a bad analogy about stress and how if we approach stress properly and use the energy of stress, we can have benefits not only for our emotional state, but for our physical body and indeed for that precious resource, our mental function. Thank you very much. <clears throat>